Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I was asked recently, how do I, as a transhumanist, deal with the second law of thermodynamics and its alleged implication of the eventual heat death of the universe and essentially the elimination of all complex systems within the universe, such as living human organisms. I am, of course, an advocate of indefinite human life extension, and for myself, I would like to live as long as possible. This questioner implied that there was some sort of necessary upper limit to how long that could occur, even with all of humankind's technological advances. And I have several layers of responses to this. The first layer of response will just address that argument on its face and ask a kind of so what question. Because even taking that theory at face value, that there will at one point in time be a heat death of the universe, that is a long ways off. A common estimate is that unless something else happens beforehand, this heat death of the universe would occur in 10 to the 100th power years. That is one Google. That is one with 100 zeros following it. Now that's much longer than typical human lifespans are today. If I could expand my longevity from 80 to 90 years to one Google years, you bet I would take that irrespective of what would happen at the end of that time interval. And this goes for much shorter time intervals as well. I'll take 150 years, I'll take 1,000 years, I'll take 1 million years, if that is all that scientific progress can make available to me. More is better, of course, but if some sort of larger calamity occurs afterward, that is no reason to refrain from pursuing marginal or incremental expansions of one's life expectancy. I mean, does the fact that right now your life expectancy is in the 70s or 80s dissuade you from trying to live past 25 or 30? And of course, unless you're suicidal, it doesn't. You still want to live, even though there is a probability that your longevity will be limited in some way. So what I am advocating and what transhumanists and other champions of indefinite life extension are advocating is more is better. We want more. We don't know when it will end. Obviously, we don't even know if we will avoid some sort of fatal accident tomorrow, but we would like to, and we would like to exert our utmost efforts to get that longevity as high as possible. So that's the most direct response to that query. But I think we can be even more optimistic than that, because in my view, the hypothesis that all meaningful existence in the universe will end with this kind of heat death, where all energy throughout all of existence will become equalized and useless, essentially, is a misunderstanding of the strict meaning of the laws of thermodynamics. That is, there's a different way to look at it. And before we look at the second law of thermodynamics, I think it's fitting to start with the first law. I am not a physicist or a chemist, I'm a layman, but I am also a philosopher. And I think when looking at laws of physics or chemistry or any of the natural sciences, it's important to take them within their proper scope, not to take them beyond what they actually mean and construct some sorts of elaborate metaphysical theories from them that suggest that humankind, in its woeful and pathetically limited current state of knowledge, can predict the fate of all of existence one Google years from now. I certainly don't think that humankind, in its current age of barbarism, has attained that kind of prophetic ability. But we do know something. So the first law of thermodynamics 
posits that there is a conservation of energy, that energy is neither created nor destroyed. It does not come into or out of existence. Individual entities or systems can gain or lose energy. And, uh, for instance, if energy is lost in the form of performing work, like you roll a boulder up a hill, that kind of energy can then be imparted to another entity. On the other hand, some energy is just dissipated as heat. It's lost, and as far as we know, it's absolutely useless for doing any further work on any other system. The second law, then, is one that says that when there is an isolated system, one that's not affected by other systems, the level of entropy or disorder within that system never decreases. So the system can only become more disorderly as an isolated system. It essentially loses useful energy. Energy dissipates out of it as heat. So if you have, say, a machine in a factory and it runs on some sort of fuel and you don't refuel it, you just let it keep running, it's going to lose some of that energy as heat. And the third law of thermodynamics, just to make a complete discussion here, says that the only time you have zero entropy in an isolated system is when that system is at absolute zero temperature. That's about negative 273 degrees Celsius. And absolute zero, exact absolute zero, is unattainable. So essentially what the three laws in combination suggest is that any isolated system left alone is going to experience an increase in entropy and disorder and a decrease in the ability to do useful work. But it's important to understand the limitations of this formulation. The limitation is that it pertains to an isolated system. That is to say, an external system can come into the picture and impart more energy onto that other system. So let's use the example of the machine in the factory. A worker can come in with a container of fuel and pour it into the machine, and the machine can keep on working. And even though all of the time that the machine is working, there is some heat that's dissipated and it can't be captured as subsequent energy, it can't be captured as subsequent fuel, that machine is not alone. And for as long as outside entities come in and do work on that machine, perform maintenance on it, put fuel into it, uh, repair it when it breaks down, it can potentially continue indefinitely to do what it does. That's not a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. The mistake, in my view, of those who posit that the second law of thermodynamics requires a heat death of the universe, and this is a large contingent of individuals, it's a mainstream scientific hypothesis. I think it's an incorrect one, though, because it treats the universe as essentially a thing, an isolated, unitary system that is like that machine within the factory except writ large. That, sure, you can have within the universe entities coming in from outside to put fuel in the machine, but the totality of all of these entities, the machine, the workers, the planets, the stars, that's got to, on net, increase in entropy, and eventually the outcome is going to be just essentially an even distribution of useless heat everywhere. I don't buy that because I don't buy the premise that the universe as a whole is comparable to a machine or a human organism, or a planet, or a star. The universe is not a thing. The term universe is just a convenient expression that people use. What it stands for is everything that exists. So it's a placeholder. 
in essence. We don't want to, whenever we make generalizations, enumerate a laundry list of, oh, here's this table, here's this chair, here am I, here's the planet Earth, here's the planet Mars, and we could go on and on listing trillions and quadrillions and any number, really, of entities, depending on how we describe them. So the term universe is really a time saver. We're just saying, look, I don't want to enumerate this laundry list of things, so I'm just going to refer to everything that exists. We don't know what the scope of that reference is. We have absolutely no idea what, if any, the limitations of that reference are, and in my view, there probably aren't any, in the sense that we do have observational tools, we have telescopes, we have spacecraft, they've been able to give us some idea of a small chunk of existence, very small chunk. We know quite a lot about our planet, we know a bit about our solar system, we know a little bit about our galaxy. Just recently, there have been some amazing discoveries by the Kepler program of actual planets within other star systems, including planets that are very close to having the conditions where life could arise. So we're constantly finding out more. But we don't even know a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what is it that this convenient reference of universe encompasses. So there's absolutely no reason to suggest that the universe is like this single machine at the factory, or like one of us, or even like one of our planets, or even like our solar system, in the sense that the second law of thermodynamics would apply equally to the entirety of everything that exists as it would apply to a single entity in isolation or a single system in isolation. To put it even more bluntly, we don't even know if it is possible to enumerate all of the entities that currently exist. Who says that we could put a number on it? Who says that the farther out we go, the farther out we explore the universe, we won't just keep finding more and more things, more and more stars and planets or some other phenomena we don't entirely know about. All of the inferences, all of the hypotheses that have been made have been made using current observation and currently available observational tools. So to suggest a heat death of the universe, I think, is premature. And furthermore, given how scientific theories have been revised and in many senses improved upon over the course of humanity's very brief history, considering that the Ptolemaic model of the cosmos, which placed the Earth at the center of everything and posited that it was immovable and stationary and the stars were just celestial objects comprised of a completely different uh, material, though they wouldn't even have seen it as material than the Earth, that was dominant even 500 years ago. Copernicus published his heliocentric model of the universe in 1543. Galileo was put on trial less than 500 years ago in 1633. And it was really only during the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century that most people accepted that, no, the Earth isn't really the center of all of existence, that, yes, the Earth does indeed revolve around the Sun, and later on it was recognized that the Sun also is not stationary, that entire galaxies are not stationary, that there's a whole lot of motion within the universe. And that's just correcting a very simple misconception that people had. So what would the state of our understanding of how celestial bodies behave be in a thousand years? It would be amazing, to be sure, compared to where we are now. And I think our state of understanding the scope of existence, the breadth of existence, would be similarly improved. So I think the fallacy, to recap, 
of this idea that there is some inevitable heat death of the universe is the treatment of the universe in the same way that the objects that we encounter every day are treated, or even the large-scale objects that we observe, when really the term universe is a conversation saver. So with that in mind, I don't know if humankind is going to exist indefinitely. Obviously, I can't know because I cannot predict the future, just like I do not know if I am going to exist indefinitely. But there are large-scale perils that loom on the horizon, on a much more proximate horizon, than the proposed heat death of the universe. For instance, the Earth and the Sun would not be around indefinitely, according to the best scientific understanding, if we just allowed matters to proceed as they do now, without human intervention, and hopefully by that time human civilization will still exist and be sufficiently advanced, the Earth has, oh, maybe another five billion years of existence in store for it. That's much closer to us now than one Google years. So that's a problem that I think human beings need to put their minds to. But there are even more proximate problems. What about the possibility of an asteroid hitting the Earth and causing the sort of extinction that ended the Mesozoic era and the age of dinosaurs? That's an even more proximate problem. It could happen in one million years. It could happen even in a hundred years. What about even more proximate problems? What about natural disasters? Major earthquakes, major hurricanes, major tornadoes. We've seen in 2011 how devastating those disasters can be. So how can we better predict them? How can we better prevent them? And how can we better mitigate the damage? What about the everyday problems that we face? The everyday killers of human beings? The myriad diseases that still haven't been cured? the wars by which human beings senselessly slaughter one another with absolutely no justification and no greater good, no matter what the rhetoric may suggest. There are so many biological problems, there are so many calamities, there are so many societal problems, and we can keep zooming in closer and closer to our own time to see just how many problems there are at every scale and to see that this doesn't change anything in terms of our fundamental philosophical imperative to try to solve as many of those problems as we can, to try to extricate ourselves from as many of the perilous conditions that we're in, and to make life better. Because ultimately that's what transhumanism is all about. That's what humanism is also all about. It's about making human lives better. For you, for me, for everyone. So that is my response. That is why I am not concerned about what the second law of thermodynamics might spell for the universe one Google years from now. Thank you very much.